Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Father Argo edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Father Argo. And today is December something, it's Advent. Yeah, it's Advent. Second week. <laughs> yeah. you, you, you got that absolutely correct. All right, on the other camera, you can't see him because we do our best to hide his identity. It's probably the worst kept secret in all Anglican uh, dumb, but is Father Argo. And we're going to talk a little bit about the geopolitics of the Middle East, maybe some good uh, information about uh, stuff going on here in America. But it's an opportunity when he comes back to the U.S. and has good Skype to sit down and, and talk about all things Anglican, all things Middle East. First and foremost, a lot of people want to know how your back is. Last time we spoke to you, you were laid up after a fall down a uh, marble staircase in Iraq. What's going on? Uh, it's flaring up again. So, um, y you know, occupational hazard and uh, being a middle-aged missionary. So <laughs> we, you know, fly a couple hundred thousand miles a year. Add that into, you know, having a machine gun and running around the mountains with the Kurds. Uh, you know, it just happens. So it's it's in pretty bad shape. So prayers are appreciated. That's good. Um, last time we spoke, you were, I think, uh, Iraq-Kurdistan uh, border. Um, you are no longer there because you can't get back into Kurdistan. I think we need to let our audience know a little bit about the politics going on in the Middle East. They don't love Americans, do they? Um, no, they really don't. Um, you know, and then we had one really good ally there, the Kurds, and uh, they feel like you know we completely betrayed them and sold them out, both in Syria, the Kurds, and in Iraq. And so they're not um, exactly happy either. But it's not a deep-seated hatred like the rest of the region. Um, the, uh, when we go to meetings, they yell at me for about an hour, and then we have tea, and then go for shawarma. It's okay. So uh, th you know that'll that'll work itself out. They're they're loyal friends, but they are disappointed in us tremendously. Well, people watching TV this week saw Putin celebrating the victory over uh, ISIS in Syria um, back a couple months ago. Iran. Uh, pseudo invaded Syria and uh, invaded Kurdistan as well, but that was kind of a secret. Yeah, and and you know the take on the ground, and I, this I think is new information for people back home. Um, the sort of a, the elimination of ISIS is not a big deal over there. They're not even interested in it. We think it. They think it's just for show. It's not serious in a sense that they know that something. Uh, as bad or worse will replace it. So while well, we're fixated on oh the great defeat of ISIS here and the liberation of Mosul, um, over there the, there there was no interest whatsoever in it really, and and their sense of it was sort of trepidation because it would possibly even make things worse. Uh, you know they this is you know it's the Middle East when people are talking about the good thing about ISIS. <laughs> Strange concept, but you got to understand the region. Um, they've been fighting for eight thousand years. They're good at it. Their their take is that uh, uh, ISIS at least was centralized. You could sort of deal with a centralized enemy, and they had you know clear structure, clear uh, border lines. And with the you know the the going away of ISIS, what's happening is now things are very fragmented and fractured, and but just as volatile. Uh, and potentially just as bad. So that's the, the news about ISIS is not necessarily big news over there, to be honest. Well, this all started with the, the fall of Saddam Hussein. Um, a, a despot was deposed, uh, executed, kicked out, and that left an incredible power vacuum. Um, and what replaces those vacuums is always something worse. Yeah, the, the, one of the number of errors that the, the U.S. made a big one was if you're you're gonna uh, tackle Iraq then necessarily you're gonna have to deal with Iran because Iraq is majority Shia uh, which is you know Iran's hub and so if you uh, you you destabilize or you knock over a domino uh, in Iraq uh, it's there's going to be consequences when you do anything in the Middle East there are unforeseen consequences but you should be a little smarter so a very fundamental thing that the U.S. should have known is that if you uh, engage with Iraq, you're going to have to engage with Iran. And they missed that. 
and so then we end up with this this situation. And I, I think you know, same with Syria. Um, and you might be doing objectively good things. You know, Saddam's a bad guy, get him out. Assad, bad guy, get him out. But at the end of the day, uh, we broke Iraq and can't put it back together again. And we've allowed for the rise of what they call the second great Persian empire now. I'll talk about that in a second. But no, also I, in that's Syria. That's biblical. <laughs> well, I think they're calling it that. That's straight off the, the news mm. from there. Um, you know, in Syria, you know, the U.S. has to own that one. Eight million displaced people, one million dead, because the U.S. decided to bother Assad. You know, and the, the Kurds even there said, you know, it wasn't great under Assad, but when the U.S. wasn't bugging him, it was tolerable for us. Things got a lot worse when the U.S. decided to poke at Russia by messing with Syria. And that's what that was. And we broke it. And so, you know, we have this mess in Iraq. We have this mess in Syria. We can bring in two parties and two administrations. You know, uh, you know there's, there's plenty of blame for everybody. And that's our problem in the U.S. is because we do not understand Islam and we don't understand tribalism, that there are unintended consequences for, for every action. So what's happened now is Iran, now the, the, the new Persian Empire stretches from the Gulf to the Mediterranean. You have Iran, Iraq, they refer to Iraq as a colony of Iran, and then uh, Syria, Lebanon are under uh, Iran's orbit. And um, uh, that's where, where we find ourselves now, is this, this great new Shia Persian empire uh, was sort of unleashed uh, when we took Saddam out of the picture. So what can we geopolitically in America do from here on to to not make mistakes like that again and to fix the mistakes we made? Uh, you know, again, we need to we need to really think about Islam. We have to understand the Shia Sunni, you know, divide. And, uh, you know, they're they've been fighting since 680 in, in Iraq, Battle of Karbala. I mean, we wandered right into it, and yes, it, did. that's never going. To, that's not going to stop. And so, you know, for example, what's happening now is ISIS was Sunni, the Shia from Iran have come over and kind of wiped them out. Well, guess what? The Sunnis are not going to put up with this. So we, I've been saying this, and it started happening a couple weeks ago. The Sunni militias are back. That we kind of got under control in 2004, 5, 6, and so it's just going to keep, you know, repeating itself. You know, I think from a U.S. perspective, number one is, uh, um, you know, we're not really good at nation building, and uh, we should probably stay out of that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and in general, I think the course is we should stay out of things. And for example, now the Shia are getting the upper hand. We should be working with the Sunni moderate states to sort of deal with that. Now, people aren't getting what's going on in Saudi Arabia right now. It could be a Gorbachev-like revolution happening. That, that's really interesting what's happening in Saudi. So instead of this very two-faced player we've had in Saudi, uh, you know, they're really happy for us to send our troops to die and, and for us to give them a blank check to fight their wars. Uh, the pressure is kind of on them now to handle their own neighborhood. But we seem to have a new royal family and a royal uh, leader uh, who, who is somebody maybe more trustworthy, and that's a positive development. But we need to work with the Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia to sort of check Shias and, and Iran, but not get directly involved. Well, we now involved. we now have for the first time a severe nuclear threat in Iran um, that was not there five years ago or ten years ago, and it's interesting to watch the new crown prince in Saudi Arabia be afraid of Iran so much so that he's willing to stand up and maybe go to war against Iran. Yeah, I've had friends in, in um, Virginia and, uh, uh, and also State Department DC who told, uh, consistently told me the same thing for, for a decade is um, don't worry about Israel. Iran's going to come for Saudi first. <laughs> that's that's they're gonna go they hate them actually more mm -hmm. and they're gonna go for them first you have to understand that Shia Sunni divide they they want to fight with each other more than they want to fight with Israel um, you know and a mistake again the US made is is really with Syria Israel is very well positioned to deal with Syria you know we we, we poked that hornet's nest and broke that country irrevocably when you know Israel pretty much can manage Syria when they need to 
but yes, this this everything we've been seeing for a long while has really been jockeying between Saudi and Iran. That's what's been going on. That there's a big jockeying that ripples across the Middle East, and it's just um, moving into a new phase right now with a nuclear Iran. So same dynamic. It's just you have the Shias who are nuclear capable. It adds to the challenge. It really does. Okay. What has to happen for you to go back to your ministry in Kurdistan? We need a move of God. Um, you know, right now, uh, so you have to understand that we were invaded. When you hear Baghdad, you need to think Tehran. Mm-hmm. We were invaded by Iran. Ninety percent of the troops on the ground in Kirkuk, which was the Kurdish city with all the oil that was invaded, ninety percent of the troops on the ground were Iranian regulars, Quds Division. Um, I got into it with the State Department, so I'm watching on TV Shia militia, that's Iran, driving U.S. tanks coming at us. And I see a press conference saying the U.S., this is like two weeks into this, the U.S. denying that Iran has any involvement in this. And I'm watching it on TV. As a matter of fact, so then I talked to some people there, and it wasn't a great conversation because they wanted me to prove it. That you know, you've got to be kidding me. And and and, and this, what was interesting was this summer when I was in Mosul, I was um, uh, working or around alongside the Shia militia, and they told me we're coming for you next. We're coming for Kirkuk. That was in July. So if little old me knew that, probably people in Washington knew that, and we just let it happen. So. Right now, Kurdistan, which is a loves the U.S., a U.S. ally, they've done so much for U.S. interest in the region, we completely hung them out to dry. So we are surrounded now by Iranian Shia troops, Iraq, same thing. Uh, our airport was closed in September, and um, they now are ordering, they want all Westerners out of Kurdistan, and you have to pay a fine after December 15th, plus your exit visa. So it's you can get out. It will be unpleasant. You cannot get back in. The only look when your your neighbors are uh, Syria, Turkey, uh, Iran, and Iraq. It's a tough neighborhood, and uh, we have great block parties. And <laughs> so the only <laughs> the only way the only way so the, uh, the only, there's two ports and it would be Baghdad that's completely out. Um, I'm I'm not going through there again. Leaving wasn't really much fun, and they won't let me back in. Uh, Turkey is our only other possibility, but the Turks are mad at the U.S. right now, so they have closed the overland route for us, just for Americans. So uh, officially, there's no way in. Uh, so you can pray, please pray for either our airport to open, or um, we can get creative, and um, we might creatively get back home to Kurdistan. We're working on that. It's interesting to watch you travel. Uh, obviously. You start off in Africa, you've been to uh, many parts of the Middle East, and you keep coming back to the place with even crazier politics, America. <clears throat> what do you think about going on around here? I, you know, I come back here, and then I just want to turn around and go back to the Middle East where it's saner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and you know, the really frustrating thing here is to watch sort of Christians behaving badly. Um, you know, and just you know, people so worked up about is is Starbucks Christmassy enough? And you know, I, I you know we live in a place where we're not running around saying Merry Christmas, and you know the gospel's moving, and we're seeing people come to come to Jesus and know Him and follow Him and love Him, and um, you know here we get we get stuck on stupid, uh, you know, and, and get into these silly battles, um, and yeah, it's it's you know we just have to get back to the main thing and not get sidetracked, which I think the U.S. is pretty good at. Well, from all my missionary friends in the Middle East, maybe about a dozen now, um, their reports back to me is Jesus is alive and well in the Middle East. Uh, yeah. Things are growing, people are being baptized, and the gospel is spreading. Back here in America, I'm not seeing that. Tell me some of the good news from the Middle East. Well, it's actually the whole Islamic world. I mean, we've talked about this before. We are seeing the the largest move of God in history uh, since 632 it, among Muslims globally right now. It's happening. It's God's time for them. Uh, a big piece of that is that 30% of Muslims who come to know Jesus and follow him come from a dream or a vision of Jesus. That's big. 
and it's not like Scandinavian prayer card, blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus. It's mm-hmm. not a picture. Or, it, it, it's actually Jesus. He speaks to them. And um, the one of the perks of our job is, uh, besides frequent flyer miles um, and lots of trips to the chiropractor, is uh, we work daily with people who have met Jesus and having have experienced him, met him for real, and talked to him. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, yeah, and so what we're looking, what we're seeing are these disciple-making movements, DMMs we call them, across the Islamic world. Uh, that's where, just for definitions, I think they matter. We declare we've seen a disciple-making movement where certified, and you have to be counted, uh, because there's some evangelically speaking that goes on. Um, you know, <laughs> you have to be certified and counted. It's where we see a thousand baptisms or a hundred replicating church plants among unreached peoples over a five to seven year process. Okay, so we have uh, 200 plus of those on the planet right now. About 88 to 90 are in the Islamic world. We have one in a certain part of the Islamic world. Get this, it's taking in eight countries and 20 people groups. Uh, We have two certified in the Middle East. Uh, That's all I wanted to say about that, but uh, we have some connection to one of those. And the other thing we're seeing is that it's among the refugees. Wherever there are particularly the Syrian Kurdish refugees, they are in play right now. They, that God is moving among them, whether they're uh, in Lebanon or Jordan, even back home in Syria. I don't want to talk about that too much, but even in Syria we have movement. And um, so we see God moving in crisis, uh, particularly among these people. And Islam is in crisis. I mean, it's a constant crisis. Uh, the Middle East is a constant dumpster fire. So, of course, we should expect to see God moving because um, they're asking questions. They're rattled. They're shaking. I was uh, with a, a former well, an ISIS guy in Mosul. Clearly, he was an ISIS sympathizer, and it didn't go well. They, you know, they didn't have – his children were covered in lice. They hadn't really eaten in about four months much. They had no power, little food. And it was a disaster for them. This is right in Mosul in the combat. And, and he, this was looking up going, why God? Why? We thought we had it. The final caliphate. Mm, didn't work. No. So what's the answer? And that's what's happening in so many places right now. And they're, they're asking questions. But we just we need boots on the ground. We have to have missionaries and, and local believers to work this through with them. Well, I have a friend who's in a camp in a country that starts with S, it's a refugee camp, and it's like a wildfire going on there uh, as far as the the spread of the gospel. And, you you know, it's where the least and the lost are is where he's uh, finding home and growing. Yeah, that's uh, to get this paradigm, and again, all we're doing is describing what God is doing. This is ontological. Mm-hmm. God is doing something. The, the field workers are, are watching for what God is doing, trying to do what God is doing, and then try to convey this back to our home, to the West, because God is alive and well and doing something. One of the hard things for the U.S. to make a paradigm shift is how quickly, when these things move, how fast they move. We say go slow to go fast. There is, you know, there is a, a lot of perseverance. People are going to die it's going to be very bumpy. It's going to be very messy. But when they start moving, they move. So we have one place where in um, spring we had 50 discipleship groups, 50 groups of Muslims studying the Bible, you know, somewhere either in the kingdom or close. uh, Six months later with an outside auditor, 373 groups. Mm -hmm. Just when they move, they move. We have one guy in the Middle East, an indigenous guy, has a thousand church plants under him uh, in a seven-year period. They move very fast. And the U.S. is, because, you know, we think success is having a 10% increase in Sunday attendance. They think success is, oh, we planted a little church here, or we're, we're getting more, you know, we're filling up. We don't think that way. You know, I'm not impressed with church. We're, we're movement people. We're not impressed with Oh, we've even doubled the number of churches. That's not impressive to us because we come from this place where we see God moving so much. We, we look at it very differently, which is we are going for a whole people group, all. We are not going for 
planting more churches. We are, you know, of course, when that happens, you're going to end up planting churches, but we work backwards. We're going to reach all the curves. What does that look like? So, you know, adding, you know, even doubling the number of churches a year, that's, you know, that's not interesting to us. Because when we see God moving on a people group, it goes like wildfire. But we have to think big like God thinks. He wants all. <laughs> yeah. And he's to all. So we're going for all. You know, it, it looks like. as much as we think we do here in America, we're, we're not impressing uh, God that often. Um, I do want to thank you for your time. We've uh, we've reached up to the average American's uh, attention span at about 20 minutes here. Um, how can people support you? Uh, should I put up another link to your uh, website? Yeah, uh, we are uh, doing our Advent Conspiracy, which is our conspiracy to uh, take back Christmas and put Jesus front and center. And we do that by uh, worshiping fully, spending less, giving more, loving all. Practically, with this movement, we have a lot of Anglican churches doing it this year, is reduce your holiday spending by 10%. Americans spend $600 billion on Christmas. It costs $30 billion to give the whole planet, planet clean water. Mm -hmm. So uh, for $50, you can sponsor a refugee family in the Middle East, a Christian refugee family, and that gets them a month's worth of food and, uh, and toys and blankets, which they really need. And when money comes in, 100% turns up over there, and then they go out and do it, get the blankets to them, the food. We've covered 2,000 Christian refugee families so far this Advent. That's amazing, but we have a lot more to go um, in about 42 refugee villages. So every $50 provides Christmas hope and joy and some comfort for a Christian refugee family there in the Middle East. So go to the website. I want to thank you for your time. I want to wish you and your family a Merry Christmas. Um, I've seen reports that you have uh, siblings, not siblings, uh, a daughter uh, doing what you're doing. The duck. Codename Duck. Duck, uh, huh? duck is uh, actually, thank you for asking, as of about one hour ago, she is officially a staff member of YWAM. Wow. Uh, which has a very strong Anglican uh, component to it. So mm -hmm. she is, uh, she'll have to staff uh, for about two years, training and leading outreaches. And she wants to, she feels God calling her to the Middle East as well. So um, we have a succession plan, it looks like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, she was our difficult child. And of course, that means that she was the, had the best skill set to be a frontline missionary because we're not easy people. Nope. Um, Everyone likes to meet 8,000 miles away. Uh, you know, the crazy uncle in the attic we invite in once a year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so thanks for asking about Duck. And she's, uh, she's graduated after six months of uh, field training. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Father Argo. And you've been watching episode, I think it's 352. I'll have to double check. It's in the 350s of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>